together. Hunter is, uh, he is my Kim Jong-il. Uh, he's, he's, he's my great <laughs> leader. Your leader. <laughs> yeah. I, he, he really, he puts together such great ideas and the fact that he can slow down time is just incredible. <laughs> shrink time, shrink time. Shrink yeah. time. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> oh my god, really funny. What's happened, everybody? This podcast was started so that we could talk to really interesting people and, and challenge and change our minds. And I don't think anybody does it better than Michael Malice. Uh, his new book, The Dear Leader, Unauthorized Autobiography of Ch- Kim Jong Il, breaks down North Korea. It's written in first person, and it's it's funny at the same time. It's extremely bleak. It's a must must read. And this is following his. I would say award-winning podcast if there was awards for podcast uh, on the Brian Callen show. Him and Hunter, the body mots, go toe-to-toe in this this battle. And they ended in the first podcast. Second podcast covers it. I hope they do a thousand more. Uh, go check out his site. Go support his books. Go listen to him talk. He's fantastic, hilarious guy. I love this guy. You're going to love him too. Enjoy. I heard you first on the Hunter Mott's uh, Brian Callen show, which I, I stated at, and you and Hunter got into this kind of debate at the end, and I instantly knew I wanted to talk to you because it was almost like uh, an intellectual street fight. Uh, with you, <laughs> you know what? We had a follow-up uh, uh, podcast, and oh, he, 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 he said, no holds barred. And I said, there will be blood. That's exactly right. That is a great, great metaphor. <laughs> I that day was like I'm gonna get a concert hall. I'm gonna rent. T- I'm gonna sell <laughs> tickets because it's gonna be a bloodbath. <laughs> yes, that's true. We and, really went at it. Yeah. And we had Hunter on the show, and Hunter, it, brilliant guy. And usually he can nail your position before you t- before you say anything. But for you, uh, do you just naturally go the other way, or those are your true anarchist views? Oh, those are my true views, but you know, as you probably saw, I did, have we started recording by the way? Yes. Okay. So you saw, I did uh, Matt Hughes's book. Yes. So I guess you can say this is kind of the Matt Hughes versus BJ Penn fight where Ah. he's got the technique and he's trying to pin me down. But my, uh, as Matt described it, BJ's joints don't work the way normal (laughs) persons do. So it's going to be very hard to get me into that, you know, rear naked choke. Wow. So you're Matt Hughes and Hunter's BJ Van, BJ Penn. And I will, well, I'll, I'm I'm Matt Hughes' co-writer. You know, I I, I co-author yes. his book. Yes. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't be his BJ Penn because I'm his, his good buddy, great great guy. Uh, I would never step in a in a cage with him. That's for sure. Mm, yes, but <laughs> Hunter Hunter Mots maybe. Yeah. Oh yes. Um, uh, the Photoshop will get done. Really <laughs> I would love to go toe to toe with him on the stage or with anyone. It's fun. Um, did you know Hunter beforehand, or he just? I did not know. He read your book and contacted you. I think a, he said a fan uh, advised uh, him that I'd be good for the show, and, and apparently they agreed. Wow! Yeah, you are fantastic on that show. Well, thank you. Um, and the book is—it's outrageous and. Uh, just absolutely captivating and, and I'm not a big reader I like to listen to the books and I know a lot of people uh, that listen to this podcast are listeners so we're hoping that eventually you're going to get an audio version of this yeah my well the book as, as that you allude to is uh, Dear Reader it's the unauthorized autobiography of Kim Jong-il it's North Korea from Kim Jong-il's perspective uh, so I went there and I adapted all their works into, give you, into giving you like the story of his life and as people learn about his life, they're learning about how North Korea got to be the way it is. Because I was thinking, you know, everyone's interested in the subject, but you can't read a light, fun book and learn what's going mm-hmm. on there. And people should know what's going on there. Um, so if I was going to do an audio book, my hope is to get uh, someone like George Takei to do it. Oh. Uh, because, because Kim Jong-il hates the Japanese. Uh, so it would be even funnier that a Japanese person it would be kind of twisting the knife against the dear leader. Well, let's take that. Do you believe that the North Korean, obviously you believe this, the North Korean state, because of the Japanese, the Chinese, the, everybody going in, and do you think that's turned them into such a, uh, an aggressive situation because the Japanese basically treats Koreans uh, like second-class citizens? Well, sure, but I mean, I think any country, uh, and this includes America, we're going to have some kind of 
enemy out there is an excuse to justify sometimes us doing things. Um, and uh, So North Korea very heavily says we need to have a huge army because as soon as we drop our guard, the Americans and the wicked Jeb devils, as they say, are going to invade and kill everyone. So this is a myth that they tell their people, and they have, they have been telling the people for 70 years. Uh, there's a little bit of truth to it, because during the Korean War, you know, Korea, you know, you had on one side U.S. and the U.N., on the other side you had Russia and China, uh, and Korea was stuck in the middle, and it was absolutely devastating for the Korean people. So they remember that, and, and they don't want that to happen again. So that's a little bit of truth that the North Korean government exploits to justify their enormous oppression. So you tell the entire tale you go over to north korea to check it out yourself you yeah. uh, the situation is it's bleak but they try uh, to i'm sorry they try to show you another side but you can tell it's not the truth yeah it, it bleak is a great word for it but it, it kind of understates it because mm. everything you know it, it's, it's almost impossible to describe someone who hasn't been there and i couldn't even imagine it before i was there and i tried very hard because everything they they don't have anything nice. Like everything you look is shabby, right? Mm. So every single carpet will have a stain. Uh, if you have like an elevator bank with keys, one key will, uh, with buttons, excuse me, one button will be out of place mm -hmm. compared to the others. You know, there'll be a, a scratch on the wall, chip paint. Everywhere, everywhere you look, uh, there's something, you know, a little bit wrong. There's a fly everywhere you go, you know, things like that. So they can try to make things look nice and, you know, they don't really even have electricity in Pyongyang, the capital city. And when, when they're trying to make things look nice, this is something that I don't think Americans often appreciate. It's not that they're trying to make things look nice for tourists. You know, we went to restaurants in Pyongyang, their capital city, mm -hmm. and they had these like, cheap plastic flowers and those tacky placemats, you know, with pictures on them. And they're you know, hideous and awful. And then you realize, look, this is the best these people can get because they're only allowed to buy goods from China. Mm -hmm. So their equivalent of a great place to buy furnishings is what we would call a 99 cent store, you know, Chinese made crappy products. Yeah. So the people desperately want some element of beauty in their lives, but because of the government, this is forever denied to them for no reason whatsoever. Wow. That's incredible. Do you feel that they understand the situation is information leaking into the North Korean population about the outside world? Yeah. One of the wonderful things that's happening in North Korea right now is that the government does not have the money to feed everyone. Mm -hmm. It used to be back in the day, everyone got fed and that was kind of a good thing. Now people aren't getting fed. That means that the guards aren't getting fed. Mm -hmm. So people are going to China crossing Tumen River at the Northwest of North Korea and they're coming back with information. They're bribing those guards mm -hmm. uh, with food and money. And that allows people to get fed, but it also, you know, carrying over information doesn't carry any weight, you know, that's in your sure. head. So, you know, North Korea is a very gossipy country, and that's a great thing that's happening to bring down the regime. And listen, it's going to be very hard to use propaganda and ideology to convince you to have loyalty to regime when you're hungry, when your kids are hungry. You know, people want their kids to have food. It's just no matter where you go on earth, this is not a complicated thing. And if the government, which is supposedly so great, can't provide this, it's going to be very hard to tell you, you know, that this government is wonderful. Why not? Why wouldn't they be able to produce their own food? Oh, because the government controls 100% of everything, uh, and they've mismanaged the economy for 70 years. They've refused to get any foreign aid. Uh, they can't produce gasoline. If they don't produce gasoline, they can't run the factories. If they can't run the factories, they don't have fertilizer. North Korea is 70% mountains. Uh, there's not very much farmable land, and as a consequence, there's not enough land uh, to make food for all the people, but they're not going to import food because that's demonstrating weakness, right? Yes. So the people are the ones who are left holding the bags and being hungry for no reason. Incredible. I, and you made the suggestion to look on Google Maps at the prison camps. Um, yes. They have con yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, and uh, it was just, it is an extremely mountainous region. You can uh, put the tilt on the Google, Google Map now because that's about as close as I think I will be personally getting to North Korea. <laughs> and uh, it seemed like uh, maybe they were just looks like at factories it looks like their their prison camps are uh just factories <laughs> are surrounded by nothing well they, oh well they very very much keep the, the concentration camps away from other places so people can't you know because that way if you escape they'll be able to track you down you can't escape to a town and blow yeah. them in right yeah. so they, they want to make sure it, it's isolated 
but the camps are, I mean, what you're talking about factories, these camps are used as labor. They work the people to death, uh, and they have punishments even within the camps. And one of the worst things that they do, and this is something we've never seen anywhere on earth ever, is like the men who act badly are sent into the mines in the camps, mm. and they're literally never allowed to leave the mines again. So that because of vitamin D deficiency, their skin starts falling off because they, they literally will never see the sun again for the rest of their lives, and they'll die in these mines. So it's things like this that they do, and the worst part is, well, the worst part, one of the other horrible things is your entire family uh, is given a work quota because when they send someone to the camps, they send the whole family. And if you kill yourself, your family member ha members have to make up that quota of what you were supposed to produce. Oh so even death is not a release for the prisoners in these concentration camps. Well, it makes me question, is there a God, Michael? Well, their god is, is Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, and the great leader Kim Il-sung. They, they regard them as having magical powers, uh, magical blood, and, and all these other things. And, but for them, you know, you have these, these famous pictures of Kim Jong-il looking at things and Kim mm -hmm. Jong-un looking at things. The point is, these guys are the only ones who know how to run the show, and if they go away, this entire country will go to hell. So they definitely are worshipped as gods in, in those countries, in that <laughs> country. Do you believe there's a god after writing this book? Well, I, I don't know if this book, it, it, I certainly believe there's a hell, yeah. um, and, and you have 24 million people suffering under it right now, and they've been doing that for seven years, and people would rather talk about Dennis Rodman. So that, to me, is just absolutely mind-boggling. Wow. That's, it's a heavy it's a heavy conversation. and uh... Right. And that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to have the heavy issues written in a light, funny way, because people, it's, your, your brain shuts off, right? It's very hard to handle this kind of information, it's dark, it's depressing, you don't want to read it. So I'm like, let me try to make this funny and entertaining. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, you're learning the situation. So it was a hard road to hoe, but I think I pulled it off. And I think a lot of people are fascinating, fascinated with North Korea. Um, I watched uh, quite a few documentaries on North Korea. The book plays perfectly into it. And actually, th this is going to set me off on a tear and get all of your books. Uh, <laughs> and it makes me think about, is there a... Is there an approach in in a way that we can possibly bring them back into the fold? Do you th do you think that we should do the exact opposite, which you've discussed? We can't attack them. Um, we can't really do anything. Can we just announce that we're friends with them now? And somehow, is it worse to I that they're isolated? It must be. I, I, I wish I had even the semblance of answers. And, and there's some certain dark uh, reasons why there aren't answers. A good parallel we have is the, the post-Civil War South, mm -hmm. where you had all those slaves who were freed, and now that they're freed, their lives were still terrible, right? Mm -hmm. So that was a, that's going to be a big problem for these people once they're freed. They've never seen a computer. They've never been on the Internet. They've never driven a car. They don't know world history. They're not taught about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for example, because they're told that the Japanese have always been their enemies and the Americans have always been their enemies. So the idea that the Americans and the Japanese were fighting each other doesn't make sense. So they're not told about things like this. So they are com living in this complete bubble of ignorance, and it's going to be very, very hard to bring them around to some kind of productive state. Not only that, China does not want 24 million uh, people who don't speak Chinese fleeing across the border. So that's another big problem. So you, know, you have so many uh, obstacles to this. Uh, a huge percentage of North Korea's infrastructure is literally on the ground in bunkers. So they've been preparing for an attack for decades. And uh, on top of that, the people in the concentration camps, there's currently like 200,000 to 300,000, are all told explicitly, as soon as the U.S. imperialists invade North Korea, we're going to kill you all and burn these camps down. So this is the kind of things we have to juggle. Uh, and I, if I had a solution, I would put it forward. All I, knew, all I know how to do is write books and tell stories. And I'm like, okay, here's the facts as they stand. Now maybe someone smarter than me can figure out a solution to this nightmare. Because in the book you write, it's my hope that the conflict between Korea, as you, you speak as Kim Jong-il, uh, yes. and the United States can come to a similar peaceful resolution soon. Um, do you think that you don't, I, I believe that if he may want to be uh, welcomed back into this world, if we can possibly entice him with Hennessy. Well, or... yeah, I mean, they, they're, of course, absolute egomaniacs running this country. You know, they, they, Kim Jong-un is regarded as God on Earth, and, and he's treated as such in North Korea. But they, the, here's another uh, obstacle, is all these dictators, when they take their hands off the gun and, and liberalize, they themselves end up personally being murdered. If you mm. look at Libya, if you look at Iraq, if you look at Romania, 
these are awful people who have uh, hurt and killed hundreds of thousands of people. So, of course, someone's going to want to take a shot at them and, or, or, uh, or put a bullet in them. So they're not even in a position to kind of uh, uh, liberalize without guarantees for their safety. And what country is going to you know, give them guarantees of safety? So that's another big obstacle to normalizing them. And, and, and the thing is, if you have 24 million people realizing, wait a minute, we've been told lies our entire life, and we've been kept hungry and miserable for no reason other than oppression, that's going to have very, very, very uh, quick and dramatic consequences. As soon as these people get Google, you know, the regime's in trouble. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great point. Uh, I guess we're not going to solve this issue unless if we can somehow, uh, they have an epiphany as an entire country, maybe aliens. But, but even, what, even then, what do they do? You have the huge army. I mean, it would have to be the army turning their back on the regime. Mm -hmm. uh, that would, could plausibly happen, and then you'd have some kind of military dictatorship, which would be bad, but still would be a thousand times better than what they have now. How worried should the South Koreans be? Uh, not at all, because here's the thing. There, there's two types of bank robbers, right? Uh, you're in a bank, some guy comes in, he, he, he wants to rob the bank. But the first guy is shooting at the ceiling, says, give me the money. He just wants the money he wants to get out. He doesn't want trouble, right? Mm -hmm. The second guy starts shooting people at random. That's the problem, because then he's crazy, and has no problem killing, and this is going to be a long, drawn-out thing. So North Korea is like the first guy. They're firing off missiles but they're firing them into the ocean. Mm. If they really wanted trouble, they'd be firing them at South Korea or at Japan, and they're not. So they're just shooting their gun in the air to show you that they have it, but at the same time, they're not instigating a violent conflict. So they're very, very crappy. You know, North Korea is regarded, uh, you know, in the U.S. especially, as crazy and suicidal, but they've been around for 70 years. So mm. it's, I don't know what kind of suicidal person is around for 70 years, but obviously they're not very good at being suicidal, huh? No, it's, it's very... Very contrasting against, you know, ISIS or uh, maybe yes. an Islamic group. Right. Very, very different. Even though George Bush tried to put them all in one bucket, it's a completely different paradigm. They're not trying to take over anyone else. They just want to oppress their own country. And they say this explicitly. They say Korea is one nation and uh, they're extreme nationalists. So they're not interested in the outside world, including the outside world's food, unfortunately. <sighs> wow. Um, but we used to send some aid. Uh, when they used to act up in Bill Clinton's presidency, didn't we used to send aid to the Yeah, so Kim Jong-il, you know, had this idea what he called the crybaby cry baby operation. So he started showing uh, the West where all the poor people were. He goes, look how bad we have it. And, all, you know, the West and South Korea and Japan started sending him food, and he took a lot of this food and put it in his pocket. Uh, but some of it did reach the people. So, yeah, they do get aid, but they pretend that they don't. Or they pretend it's compensation for past oppression from the U.S. imperialists and the Jap devils. <laughs> I, I really do appreciate your humor. Um, and you have some really good, uh, the Japanese people will get the jokes that you're, you, did you have those prepped and ready to go when you went to uh, oh, North Korea? Uh, these aren't jokes. So the thing is, when you, uh, in North Korean literature, you have to refer to Jap bastards or U.S. bastards or U.S. devils. You can't say American because their point is to have the very language to work as propaganda, to beat into your head that these people are evil. So any reference they have to the Americans or the Japanese has to have a slur attached to it. That's just how they talk over there. So, it's that, I mean, that's how pervasive the mind control is in North Korea. Even the language itself is used to constantly teach the people into a state of uh, hatred. Man, I would love to get to... Have you interviewed uh, uh, many you know, ex North Koreans. And yeah, I've spoken to refugees. It's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Do, do they have a, a do, in the back of their mind, you know, just thinking about the nature of reality and saying this doesn't make sense, seeing Dennis Rodman there? Uh, well, I, the refugees I've met got out before Dennis Rodman. Okay. But here's like a good example. Uh, one of the refugees I spoke to, there's a very famous North Korean story how Kim Jong il's in kindergarten, and this is in the book also. Uh, Kim Jong Il's in kindergarten, and his teacher says one plus one is two. And Kim Jong Il gets up and goes, "That's not true." And the teacher's like, "What do you mean that's not true?" And Kim Jong Il says, "If I have a drop of water and I add another drop of water, I don't have two drops. I have one big drop." And this is supposed to be a justification for you know communism because you can have all the people merging together into one person in the body of the great leader, right? Mm -hmm. And the refugee I spoke to was sitting in class in North Korea, and she thinks to herself, "This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard," but she knew. 
if she said anything, it would have a dire consequences for her and her family. So at some level, you know, there's an awareness of this is nonsense. But at the same time, if you even show the slightest bit of doubting of what you're being told, you know, that, that is really, really going to be a problem. And that's what you're taught even earlier than any of these stories. So they know to keep their heads down and not to ask questions uh, or else. Man, so you basically feel what, what's your opinion on on you, you believe humans are more like uh, extremely tribal when it comes down to it when pushed they're they're going to react like this you don't think we're going to be able to evolve past uh just people being oppressed for forever well i mean i think people are naturally tribalist that they stick to their own i mean south korea you know are known to be very xenophobic and so on and so forth and this isn't just a function of koreans but uh, this is not a function of tribalism these people aren't choosing you know of their own free will to be north korean and to hate the outside world they're not given any options they're not given any information uh, and, and tribalism could, could be a function of, you know, I would prefer as a Korean person to marry another Korean person. It doesn't mean, you know, I, I'm going to shut down my borders, not have the Internet and not allow international flights. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, that, that's not a function of biology. That's a function of political dictatorship. Yeah, I just was hoping that maybe one year in a, in a future people would come together and, and a human race would work together and these situations would be eliminated but no one cares. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. one of the reasons I wrote this book is like so few people care about North Korea. They, they care about it in the sense of a carnival. Look how wacky and crazy it is. But at the same time, you know, I'm Jewish. I was born in the Soviet Union. These are two chances for me to be like in a, you know, locked away or sent to Siberia. Uh, and these people are living what I could have lived. So I felt this need, you know, to kind of be like, hey, this is not cool what's going on. People need to be informed. But People don't care. People also don't care because there's really not, not that much they can do as Americans, you know, other than be informed and, and maybe contribute to some refugee efforts. But in terms of breaking down the regime, it's, 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 it's going to have to be, uh, you know, something China is the one that's going to have to do it. Yes. Oh, wow. So what part of uh, the Soviet Union were you born in? Uh, Ukraine. The Ukraine. My wife's from Ukraine. Oh, uh, where? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Potava. Potava. I don't know that. I'm from Lvov. Lvov. Uh, it's the, the farmland, the not Russian side. <laughs> yeah. So they have a very different <laughs> outlook. And my other brother's wife is from um, the border town, and she's pro-Russian, and the other side is anti-Russian. Right, right, yeah. That's... It's very interesting. Yeah, we always spoke Russian at home, uh, and, and my family identified as Russian because we're Jewish, and apparently the Russians hated us a little less than the regular Ukrainians. That's what I'm told. It's incredible, man. You just that just that chip on your soul. When you when you tell a, star, a story about, uh, can you tell it with your father and his professor? Oh, I love this story. Yeah. So when my dad and this just happened to me to me fairly recently, uh, where I had an anti-Semitic comment, which is just you know mind blowing. Uh, my dad, you know, grew up in in Ukraine. My parents, my whole family did. And there's like nursery rhymes, it rhymes in Russian, where if there's no water in the sink, who drank it all? The Jews. It rhymes in Russian. It's much cleverer. And, you know, my, my sister went to Ukraine in the last, let's say, 15 years. I don't remember exactly when. And there was a restaurant there called Jew Style where you're encouraged to haggle over the bill. Now, we can laugh about that because it's kind of like a Saturday Night Live sketch. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is the kind of in, the environment you're, you're growing up in. This Borat stuff's no joke. And my dad told me the story when he was in college. One of his professors, you know, put his hand on his shoulder and said, trying to be nice, I'm sure, Ted, you're one of the good ones you know, meaning one of the good Jews. And it, it's just, I mean, so telling that someone would say this with a straight face and think this is normal and appropriate. And he has reason to think this is normal and appropriate because this is the culture he's surrounded by, you know? It, it's horrifying. Uh, and I couldn't imagine being in that situation because it's it's so underlining. It's so uh, just, just status quo. Uh, yeah. It, it just feels gross. But we have some of that stuff here. And I don't even mean a function of anti-Semitism of race, but I mean, if you look at the way uh, people often, from, you know, these people who read The New Yorker or listen to NPR look at the rest of the country uh, as if they're, you know, illiterate, you know, uh, uh, complete morons. It, 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 every, what, I, what you alluded to earlier, Mike, about tribalism, every group is going to have that elite who thinks that they're the only ones with intelligence, everyone else is stupid and worthless and need to be led and controlled. I mean, this is a function of tribalism as well. 
Yes, I know. I was uh, I was trying to do my part on the internet and bring. We have many Russian. Um, I started out. I still teach kickboxing, actually, um, and I started out a lot of kickboxing videos and just like MMA. I feel like a sport like that actually brings the world closer together. Um, so I was hoping that we'd get into that situation where everybody's equal, a human first, as Hunter would say. But right. maybe that's just wishful thinking. Well, I mean, isn't it actually a Brazilian first? <laughs> didn't that isn't that what the UFC proved that it's the it's the BJJ that's the good one, and it maybe is. Taekwondo is the not good one? <laughs> it is, but you're going to have to write another book soon because it, <laughs> the tide has turned. And, what do you uh, mean? What's it? Is BJJ out now? It is. The Americans learned it and they applied the wrestling. Matt Hughes is. Uh, and the wrestlers are so tough because Matt Hughes, before he was fighting, is probably wrestling eight times a day. Uh, yeah, he was all American, day. undefeated. Yeah, college so, and high school. Yes. So when you teach that guy jujitsu and he controls the situation where he wants to be, now he's become unstoppable. So where there's only one Brazilian champ right now, Jose Aldo. Um, okay. And the Taekwondo and Kung Fu kicks. There's a new fighter. You should do a book on this man. He's red hot. His name's Colin McGregor. He's uh, uh-huh. he's an Irish fighter. Uh, he's he's going to be fighting for the title soon, and he the whole entire country of Ireland is supporting him. So he's he's a huge draw. He's he he talks well, and he brings in kung fu, taekwondo, these weird old school kicks back in. So it's, oh it's wow, fast. that's very interesting. Okay, wow. That uh, the- that man. He's he's uh pay-per-view wise he he only had four fights and now he's going to get a title shot because he commands such pay-per-view and he's a great speaker what's his uh, weight class he is 145 okay so he's going to be uh jose aldo the brazilian champ okay. just defended uh, and it's it the, the styles have to evolve and yeah, that's, of course. That, that's what you saw with matt hughes he you know if you learn it somebody else learns a little bit more of a touch and uh, just keeps on pushing a pace. Yeah, it's absolutely fast. It's, it's just fascinating. He talked about this stuff also about how a lot of these guys, you know, were used to this, you know, kind of striking stuff. And as soon as he took them to the ground, they were completely powerless and they, they didn't know what to do. And especially the wrestlers have that build, you know, where they're mm-hmm. so compact and strong that that's really going to be a problem when they're on the ground because uh, unless you're like a BJ Penn, you're not going to have any uh, power to do anything. It was. Matt Hughes is, it must be, it's pretty incredible with the dynamic with this twin. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, with Matt. Yeah, with Mark, excuse me. Mark. Yeah, because Mark was actually stronger than him. And, you know, Matt Hughes gets a bad rap because people are like, oh, he's a dumb farm boy job. He's very, very, very crafty. You don't become a nine time world champion without having a head on your shoulders. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, his big realizations was he's like, I have strength. Let me learn technique as much as possible because if you have both, that's the way to win. Like strength is only going to win, let's say, half the time. Uh, you're going to be stronger than people. If that guy has technique, you're gonna, you might be screwed. So he very consciously set out early on to build as much technique as possible, and that obviously paid off for him enormously. I wonder how much having a twin, because his twin was his tra- also a training partner, correct? Correct. Yeah. So they grew. They were wrestling with each other since they were four. You know, uh, they're absolutely. And in and, and if you ask Matt, he says you would much rather want to fight me than Mark because uh, Mark because Matt would just restrain you, but Mark will put you in the hospital. Yeah. So you know, Mark would, as Matt said, would toss Matt around like a rag doll, uh, and and he actually got his start into fighting, but he just wasn't wasn't into it. But he definitely had that natural talent uh, and ability. That's it. Most almost be increase your training because you're going to see your twin, and if he's making some technical mistakes, you might be able to adjust quicker because you're actually seeing a mirror of you do it. I wonder That's if that exactly came right. to play. Oh, of course it did, absolutely. And of course, the competitiveness. If you are fighting against someone who's genetically the same as you, okay. how much is that going to push you? Oh. Uh, and, and say if he's better than me in some way, that means he's learned it because we're genetically the same. So I can I can do what he's doing now. So that was very much. Uh, a source for him to push himself as hard as he could. Mm, I need to have twins, uh, and and you've you've written books with D. L. Hughley. Yeah, oh, he's the best. Yeah, um, uh, the comedian. Yeah, I think people. That's he's a household name. Um, oh yeah, and you've written two books with him. 
Uh, I'm working on the second one right now. Yeah. And what are you What are you putting out? Oh, I can't. I, we just got the deal last week. I, I'm not allowed to talk about it yet until okay. everything's all signed, you know. But uh, he is just like the best. I've learned. Everyone I've written books with. I've learned so much about just life and about them. It, it's just a great, great opportunity. It's like, you know, how Batman became Batman. He sat down with these world experts and trained under them mm -hmm. and made himself into this great person. Bruce Wayne did. It's the same thing when you write books with, with, uh, with talented, and accomplished people. You know, you're sitting with them one on one. You're picking their brain. You're learning how they got to what they how they got to where they are today and all these skills i'm never going to be a fighter but matt hughes taught me so much you know about life and 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 things like that and deal hugely the same thing i mean i've learned so much from that man he's just a great great person so you see the parallel parallels of you know greatness that can i'm sure things cross over their work ethic oh yeah of course and that's what's fascinating it's like you know like techniques people use in their field comedy you know, fighting some of the other books I've done, you can, these tricks will, will apply in other fields as well. Uh, I mean, Matt Hughes had to look at it as a complete strategist and, and, and things like that. He also, you know, taught me a lot about being this kind of, he's such like a, he's like an alpha male. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a cartoon. So if I ever have to ask myself, what would like a real guy do? Uh, I just think, okay, what would Matt say? And, and if I get the answer, I know I'm on the right track. Yeah. Well, you got to be able to, what would Matt say? I don't know, but he's, he's able to just slam people on the head. So. <laughs> no, but I just mean interpersonally, sure. you know, the way he carries himself is a very, I mean, people uh, uh, respect him. They listen to him and it's not because he can beat the crap out of him, of them. It's because any fighter can beat the crap out of anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the whole point. But he, he really carries himself as someone who's kind of, uh, he has this energy about him that's, that's almost like a dog whisperer, you know, like he has this calm leadership uh, emanating from him that really is something that, you know, I aspire to. Wow. So what do you think the, the keys are? Is it, are these people developed in childhood? Do you see a common theme that could help? Oh, I, I wish I did. You know, I, I, you know, everyone I've worked with, I don't know that they, I do have common themes. I, I think like, you know, obviously you're in fighting, you have a toolbox and sometimes you use this tool and sometimes you use that tool. And then one who tells you, uh, that, you know, the only way to succeed is to use a hammer mm -hmm. is a person living in a world of nails. It's not always a hammer. Sometimes it's a saw. Sometimes you want to close the toolbox, you know, and, and let things just sit for a while. So, I mean, I think, and I'm, I'm sure you, you agree with this, the older you get, the more tools you have at your disposal uh, and, and, you know, the more prepared you are for a different situation. Yes, I, it's, it, you're always investing in yourself and you are the greatest investment. So, yeah, that's, I think that's a great way of looking at it. And you're you're big into air plants too. <laughs> a, oh, not air plants, succulents. That's not succulents. the same. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, but I'm kind of over the succulents. I'm looking at them right now. I'm, I'm kind of over it. What? Uh, because I I really appreciated your Instagram account because it it's kind of beautiful. Well, I still have wait, wait, I still have 200 of them. So let's be let's be let's be clear. But the point is, I've gotten all the ones I've wanted to collect. Uh, and at a certain point, it's like, okay, this is the same thing as the other one, but it's instead of red, it's green. Um, but yeah, I've got like a great collection, probably some of the best collections in the States. Uh, many of the plants I have haven't been photographed, but they're, uh, it's fun. They're all weird shapes and, and just bizarre looking, you know. Uh, it's, it's the kind of stuff that looks like an artist drew them instead of nature. So do you need things like that to, to write, to inspire you? Do you need to, is this some hobby that kind of works in between the writing? Well, you know what it is, and, and this is, I, I write for Thought Catalog, which is a, you know, a website with just writes, where people write essays, and one of the things that I think more artists need to do, when I, it's very, very hard to establish yourself as an author. It's very hard. Yes. Uh, this is not news to anyone. Uh, and it's also very hard because of how you're paid, because you get like one big check every like six months. Mm -hmm. So it's like you've got a budget like a freak, and am I going to get that next check, and when do I get the next check? It, it's not like a steady income. So one of the things I force myself to do is to put aside a little bit of money from every check I get and spend that on something fun. Because mm -hmm. if you don't, you're going to become a crazy person who's always focused on, on budgeting and not allowing yourself to reap the fruits of your own rewards. So that's like one of the reasons I got into plants. It's like, you know what, this is something that'll be fun for me to do. Uh, it's not expensive and, you know, it's it just something to connect. And it makes the house look interesting. I mean, I, they're only against three walls. It looks like you, you look at my Instagram, you think my house is a greenhouse. 
you go in the house, you don't have to notice them because most of them are the size of like a quarter, you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, so that, that's why it's kind of they're up against the windows, but uh, you're not going to see them in the rest of the house. Well, it's a, it, is, it is an interesting life being a writer, but it also must be incredibly frustrating and isolating at times. It's very isolating, yes, and I don't think people appreciate that, and I think most writers try to tell themselves that it's okay, I can just do it on my own, and they are not uh, accepting of the realization that you know people are born with some psychological needs, uh, and you have to, yeah, and it's the same thing with, you know, Matt always stressed this, I learned this from him also, when people are fighters, you have to attend to your psychology, you know what I mean, like these things, there's a big, big connection, uh, and people don't always appreciate that. I'm sure it's the case with athletes where they're like, I just got to train. It's like if you're not in a good headspace, uh, things are not going to work well for you in a physical space. And the same thing with being an author. It's like, yeah, you can write if you are, your brain is not getting stimulated and giving yourself, you know, having social contact, hang out with people. You're going to get really twisted really fast. So how, how do you maintain that? Do you, do you have a social schedule? Do you try to take trips? Yeah, I always, I always, you know, hang out with someone every day. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm heavy on Facebook and social media, uh, and and I just try to see people as much as possible and make this a conscious effort, um, as opposed to being a shut in, uh, which is really, really bad. And I, and I think that's a dangerous trap for most writers. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to stay at home uh, and work, and then you know, all your friends are gone, and you're a crazy person. I don't want that. I'm already a crazy person in, in some senses. I don't need to be full blown. That's why I did. I, do you know Graham Hancock? I know we. I, I don't know. Uh, well, he a fascinating author. I'd highly recommend his books. And uh, one clever thing he's done is he goes and does these extremely long research projects, which take him all over the world. So he doesn't get locked into the room. But at some point, he does get locked into the room. Doesn't talk to anybody for quite some time. Oh, that's, that's, I don't, I, I see, I, he sounds like a more extreme personality type than me. Like, I couldn't go long periods like that. And I also don't think I, I'd be comfortable going on long periods of not being at home. Mm. Uh, I am a homebody. I like being at home uh, and, and having that kind of sanctuary. Uh, going long periods without talking to people, I don't know how anyone can do that without starting to become the Unabomber. Yeah, really. How, just listen, why, why the hell aren't you podcasting? Like, Me? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, my last focus was on the book, and I'm on the show. Um, I'm on the show called The Independence, which is on Fox Business. So I'm out there probably like once a week as a contributor. Um, I, I, I think uh, maybe I'd get into it, but it seems like a lot of work. No, uh, I, I, I can't imagine it. You have an opinion on everything. You do. You, you're basically... Oh, you mean just me in front of a mic, running my mouth? Yeah. Oh, you know, here's the thing. So I'm on this show every week, you know, and and I talk about politics and this and that. And I no longer have any concept, since I don't work in an office, right? Mm. I no longer have any concept of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And Matt Welsh, who's one of the hosts of the show, says, just use your judgment. I go, I don't have that. All my time is on the internet, and the internet, you know, there's nothing that's inappropriate. So half the time on the show, I'll make some joke, and it'll everyone's laughing. And then I'll make a joke about 9-11, and they're just, like, you know, freaking out. So I do not have a concept of what's considered uh, acceptable and appropriate anymore. Wow. I, I can't imagine this. This is I've actually seen it on your site, so everybody should go and check out your site. And it's also on YouTube. Um, it's a Fox show. Yeah, Fox Business. And oh, Fox Business, because you say some outrageous stuff, so I would, I would worry – yeah, so some of the stuff doesn't make air. Uh, so imagine so. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's uh. Well, I'm also from Brooklyn. You know what I mean. So like, what we regard as appropriate is going to be very different from what they regard as appropriate in the Midwest. Uh, and the show airs at six o'clock on on weekends. So obviously, uh, you know, they're going to be a lot more uh, PG thirteen than me. Um, and that's fair. I mean, I'm in their house. Uh, this isn't. They're not. They're not doing anything wrong. I'm the one who's doing something wrong. Well, I doubt that. One thing they probably love about it is that you, you basically want the government uh, basically broken apart and out of our lives. I, I know that's probably a big, every business-minded uh, individual in New York probably wants less government in business. I, mean, I don't agree whatsoever. I think Wall Street very heavily wants business oh, because okay. that, I mean, don't you think? Well, yeah, they want to be able to control Washington. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think most Wall Streeters are very for business, for government, uh, in the worst sense. Well, 
it seems to be working well for <laughs> for them. That's the problem. <laughs> right, I mean, right. Go, Goldman <laughs> Sachs, fair. God bless them, because most of our clients are from Goldman, but they they just control the Fed. Right, and it's, I mean, and I think it's very unfair, not very unfair, but somewhat unfair that Goldman's the whipping boy. Goldman's not unique in this. And you also have the problem, if one company's doing this, all the other companies have no choice but to do it, just in terms of staying competitive. So it's a very pernicious system, uh, and, and the idea that if, like, let's say Goldman vanished, everything would be fine is absolutely untrue. So let me rephrase that. Basically, you're going to vote for Hillary Clinton? Well, I don't vote. I don't believe in voting. I just wrote an article for The Guardian about why I don't vote. No, I want Hillary Clinton to win because I think she would be such a disaster. Oh, I just uh, threw that be, out there. I, didn't, I had no idea you were going to vote. Well, I, Oh, uh, no. I, I really hope she wins, yeah. She, really? she would be – what's that? Why? Oh, because she would, uh, she would be so bad at it, uh, and it would be so hilarious watching her in presidency. <laughs> Uh, and she would be so ineffective. Let, let, here's two facts that no matter where you are politically, you cannot argue with. Number one, uh, when Hillary Clinton was given her first government role, she messed it up so badly, it cost the Democrats the House of Representatives for the first time in 40 years. That's mm. indisputable, 1994. Number two is, how badly do you have to blow the job interview that instead of hiring you, they hire the black dude who doesn't even have a resume? which is what happened to her in 2008. How badly do you have to blow that job interview? This woman is a complete walking calamity, uh, and I just think it's hilarious how people think she's the smartest thing in two legs when the data does not point that way. What about Ron Paul? Well, he, I mean, Rand Paul, you mean? Yeah, well, I'm still, I'm still with Ron Paul, but yeah. Well, yeah, but, I mean, I, I, I don't think our system, the only good thing, I, I mean, Ron Paul, I'm a big fan of, of course, but, I mean, he had no chance of winning, uh, and I think what ends up happening is when people who are going to be in position to change things, uh, you have the, the rest of the system circling the wagons pretty quick. Damn, Michael, you're not giving us any hope for the future. I don't think, that, I, I don't think this country is, is really salvageable. Don't, here's the thing. I'm not a particular fan of Obama, but when you look at Obama, the campaign trail, and how he was president, I think it's pretty clear that when he became president, they sat him down, they go, here's the box of what you're allowed to change. But anything other than that, you know, you're not moving anything. Uh, and I think that's why he so kind of has this broken, defeated, depressed air about him, because he really had this belief that he's going to sweep in the White House and make everything nice and good, and that's not the way things work. I, I, the only policy I could think of is we have to videotape every single conversation that goes on at the White House, and, <laughs> and because there's no other way uh, to really see what's going on. But I was, I was hoping in the future we'd probably evolve past this. Do you see any similarities between, because you're from the Soviet, former Soviet Union, North Korea, are, are things happening in this country that resemble that, the NSA? Um, well, the NSA, exactly. So uh, I think the, one of the big advantages of being raised in a Soviet household is that I'm not surprised when a lot of things, these things happen. Mm. This NSA is exactly... Is, you know, far worse than anything the KGB had ever imagined. Um, and I'm just waiting for the day when they start cashing in their chips, uh, and then Americans are going to have a very big wake-up call as to the real nature of government. Uh, it's going to be very, very bad and very, very scary, and it's going to be pretty soon, too. Okay. And I, I, I would bet money it's already happening. I would bet money that some people who would otherwise be doing things that the government does not like have been contacted, you know, not in public, and been threatened or and successfully shut up. Do you think they're collecting all data uh, as far as your Google searching? Do you think they're turning on cameras? Do you think they're turning on microphones? They've said they have. This isn't me thinking. They've said this explicitly. So they're probably listening to your computer then because I God knows what's in your Google searches. Well, I mean, they are, aren't they, aren't they explicitly saying they're recording every single phone call ever? Um, yeah, I guess that would be, that would, every single phone call, I guess. It, yeah. That would be pretty tough to control all that data, but maybe they're doing it and then they plan on processing it at some point. Exactly. So, it, right. So the problem is the processing, it's not the recording and it's going to be a lot harder and a lot more data to record every phone call than a Google search. I mean, how much data does a Google search, you know, versus, uh, you know, the, whatever the MP3 or the WAV file of every phone call. It would be a real problem if they have all the cameras and microphones on as well, and they're just streaming, recording continuously at every opportunity. That I don't know if that's the case, but certainly if they have access to your computer and all your email, 
uh, and every phone call. I mean, they, they don't need the video uh, if they've got the audio and the writing. Sure. Well, uh, where are we going to move in 20 years? Mike? <laughs> Let's go North to the moon. Korea. We're going to go <laughs> to North Korea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I actually asked some of the refugees uh, what techniques they use to avoid uh, oppression because we're going to have to start using those in the near future too. Uh, and, and there's not that many things that you can do. I mean, you, you saw what they did to Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, you know uh, what I mean? You saw what they did to Cheryl Atkinson just this week. When I heard Glenn Greenwald came back to the country, I was <laughs> frankly scared for him. Uh, I just, I, I didn't think that was a good move. He's still, ba- well, he went back to Brazil, I believe. Yeah, the thing is, it, what would happen is they're not going to end up, they wouldn't put a bullet in him, but they would, they would release some story about how he's, you know, a drug addict or something. Mm. You know, they'd set him up somehow. Uh, if you kill him, he's a martyr. But if you discredit him, that would imply that everything he's saying is a lie, and then they could have clean hands. I think that's the technique that they would use. So uh, hopefully, and it's what's really funny is all this stuff sounds like cra- paranoid, crazy people. But all this stuff is not only public record; it's admitted. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's the scary part. This isn't some of the tinfoil hat saying that air that fluoride is controlling my brains. This is their words explicitly acknowledged and admitted to, and they admitted that they've been doing this for years longer than they said they've been doing. So this is not anyone's imagination or anything like that. They have acknowledged that they're doing all this. Yeah, it's, it is scary, and I, they definitely can do it. My uh, major in college was enterprise management technology, and we used a, a software called SAP. And they, uh-huh. they uh, China uses SAP to control their entire population. It's the same thing as if you buy some soap from Walmart. They know exactly that soap was purchased, where it was purchased, another piece of soap goes out. So they use that to track their citizens. Uh, and it would be wow. very easy to use that system if you're collecting data in some spot to just easily, they've been doing it for the Chinese population, easily can do it for the American population. I'm sure they are. Yeah. And why wouldn't they? That's the whole point. Is like if they have the ability uh, there's no reason for them not to, and there's huge incentives for them to do so. And especially if the technology just becomes easier and easier, and the data that it takes you know, to store is, is more and more feasible, there's absolutely no reason for them not to do this. Because of morals, but I'm guessing you're going to say <laughs> that's not going to... Well, well, they can have some kind of moral justification that they're keeping us safe, right? Yeah. So, it, 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 I mean, they will really believe this. And I think a lot of these people just, you know, who they hire, these computer programmers... You know, are just the types who just regard this as a fun mental problem to crack, and they're not really appreciating uh, the actual consequences of the system they're building. Jesus. Well, Mike, I don't want to even. I, I, I'm gonna have to really. I'm gonna really look into real estate in Costa Rica after this conversation. <laughs> Is there any, yeah, let's go to Cuba. Cuba, maybe. Do you, Do you have a preferred sanctuary? I, uh, my house, yeah, house. <laughs> That's, yeah I, I have my plants here. I've got, but I mean, I, I think, I think I, I, it's just, not only are people naive, uh, you know, enormously so, I think even when they're shown explicit data, they're still not going to you know, throw their myths out. You know, they're still going to hold on to this dream that everything's nice and everything's fine. And if you have nothing to hide, you shouldn't have to worry. It's very easy to trick people. Oh, point. yes, yes. And that's what North Korea teaches us. And my book, Dear Reader, goes into the system, how they put this into place. Uh, well, we're going to be buying the book. And if anybody sends out, uh, we'll set up some system. If they, they go ahead and just send us an email, we'll, we'll actually buy and deliver them a, a copy of that book because I want to push it that much because I want to keep on reading um, everything you put out. It's fascinating. I wish uh, you could put out more. Uh, so we're going to get another book coming out next year. Uh, yeah, probably in a year or so, yeah, so with DL, and then I'm, I'm probably going to work on my next one uh, for myself, uh, which is going to be nice and dark and twisted, just like North Korea. <laughs> and we, we can look forward to an upcoming uh, podcast with Hunter and Brian? Yeah, in the very near future, yeah, I just call, I just spoke with them yesterday. It was oh, a great, boy. great time. They're, they're great, and they're great, great guys. I was very blown away and, and, and very pleasantly surprised.
Yeah, they they put together Hunter is uh, he is my Kim Jong Il. Uh, he's, 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 my great <laughs> he's your leader. leader. <laughs> yeah, I, he he really he puts together such great ideas, and the fact that he can slow down time is just incredible. <laughs> shrink time, shrink time, <laughs> shrink yeah. time. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> oh my god, that's really funny. So, on that note, uh, we really want to thank you. We're gonna do a, 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 a wait. Hold on. Two years spectacular. Oh, uh, do you do you know anything about two years spectacular? What what is it was this reference to? I'm not sure what that is. I'm sorry, I'm getting. We were watching it yesterday, where they hold the cards. Um. Oh, she means the Iran. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Iran is North Korea's. It's basically North Korea has this. They're very known for it. It's basically what would happen if you had Cirque du Soleil with 100,000 people. Okay, okay. Uh, and they, they have the world record for doing this. It's in a stadium, Kim Il-sung Stadium, and it's this insane, insane uh, um, kind of, uh, uh, they call it games, but it's really kind of this Cirque du Soleil uh, event where, you know, you have acrobats and people holding up cards to make pictures and just all sorts of crazy stuff. It's just absolutely mind-blowing. And that's just to celebrate the great leader? Hunter Mops. Yeah, and, have, and, and, and also in, in, it's to show that North Korea is unified and they can say with a straight face, we, we're doing the biggest show on earth, and that's absolutely true. They have the Guinness World Record. So this is one source of them to have their little bit of pride and bragging power. Well, they must feed the, those, the performers. Oh, of course, and that's why those performers are working so hard. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had, the, they had, I think, the gold record in weightlifting for some weight class. Really? Uh, and you know that that yeah, and you know that guy. He got his protein. I assure you, while the rest of the country was hungry. I'm gonna get myself some North Korea some refugees and train them in MMA. That'll be a great story. Well, Taekwondo is a Korean. Uh, they're very proud of Taekwondo because that's the Korean martial art. Oh yeah. And according to them, it's the best. Yeah, they love Taekwondo there. Oh yeah, they are hardcore people. And I've only met uh, Southern Koreans, yeah. South Koreans. I'm sure the North Korean instructors are pretty hardcore. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, I think hardcore is an understatement. You mess yes. up that cotta, you're going to prison camp. <laughs> With your family, yes. Right. Actually, you're, it's, not, it's not even a joke because a lot of these people, you know, if they are esteemed athletes, their family's treated well. But if they're not performing so well, you go to the countryside to become a farmer because now you're no longer of use. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. If I had to even do, you, you're saying that once a week I have to confess all the things I've done wrong. It, oh like, right, yes. What am I? I would feel just uh, like less than a human. I guess well, you're not regarded as a human. You're part of the country. You know, this idea that you're a human being is just what they're fighting against: selfishness and kind of self uh, self importance. You are there to serve the will of the great leader. It's a fascinating book, fascinating story. Keep on, keep on preaching. I'm going to be preaching on this end because this is just an incredible book, and and you, you it's really, really entertaining considering it's it's over. I think it's over 400 pages. Yes, yeah, um, exactly. It's 400, pretty much as a dot. Yeah, I, I, that's the whole point. I wanted to make it the kind of book you can read in the bathroom. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I don't know. I'm going to read it in the bathroom, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> on a plane, on a on beach, a plane, on a at beach. the gym. That's fun. So. <laughs> All right, you get to whatever you're going to do. I really appreciate this. Uh, we're going to blast it out and, and make sure this episode gets a lot of promotion. Mike, I had a total blast. Thank you so much for reaching out. Love talking to you. All right, brother. Take care.